Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode nine of the Universal Podcast, where every episode intersects psychology with another topic. In this episode, we'll be discussing stunt work with Jillian Armendariz. Jillian is an actress, voiceover artist, stuntwoman, producer, and fitness enthusiast. After graduating from Pace University with a BA in media communications, Jillian debuted her now sad career by dubbing English for the lead role of Sophia in the Disney live action show Limbo. She's also dubbed as Daniela in Alpha Males and appeared as an actor and stunt person in the award-winning film The Hunt, Savage Within. Jillian, welcome aboard. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. We're very happy to have you on as well. Uh, so I guess let's, let's start with this. So there are, according to the Screen Actors Guild, there's 170,000 people who are employed. These are people who are writers, editors, actors, obviously, stunt people. Amongst that group, approximately 60,000 are employed actors and even fewer, about 7,000, are stunt people. So I'd like to know more about your journey. What, what got you into this kind of career? It has been a whole journey because when it comes to being a performer, you dedicate majority of your time until you really start booking like the professional stuff. You dedicate a lot of your time to training, learning new skills, networking, hustling, the whole thing. So um, I started off just simply as an actress, you know, from New York, moved to LA and just found that it was very hard in a whole different way than it was in New York, but I, I was struggling. I was frustrated. I wasn't really knowing how to see growth or progress. And I, a little bit of luck, you know, is part of this career path, but I just so happened to be friends with a couple of stunt people. And um, I had been going to the gym to like find joy and be happy because the acting life was really hard. And one of my stunt friends was like, uh, well, now that you're really into fitness, what if I teach you a couple moves for stunts and you could be an actress who can do some stunt moves? And I was like, sure, why not? You know, it was the height of superheroes and my all time dream would be to be a superhero. So I was like, of course, I need to learn something. And I started training just like on an empty tennis court with my friend. And he was just like, you're, you're learning this very quickly. I'm going to introduce you to some stunt professionals and you can get proper training, stunt training, martial arts training and all that. And it kind of, that's, that's kind of like the shortened version of how I got into it. It was, it's, it's a path where everyone is, is empowering one another and helping one another. So you can't help, but continue on it. What exactly inspired you? to get into this field? Like what, what sort of traits do you think you have that, that, or even personality traits do you think you possess that motivated you or propelled you into this kind of field? The desire to just feel progress with any kind of skill in the world, because I grew up never really being good at anything. You know, I, and then following the path of acting, well, you know, never, if something was hard, I would find like every reason to not do it. I would convince my parents, like, you don't want me to dance or do ballet. It's going to make me be bad uh, in school. So you want me to get good grades. So I would always just convince my parents I don't need to be doing track or dance or anything. Um, and so I, I could never really stick with anything. And I just never really felt that feeling of progress, um, especially in my acting. I had a lot of toxic teachers in my life, which most actors have, but it's just, you really, it's so hard to see progress and to know that you're growing. And when I started to learn stunts, I realized that I have this like huge desire to 
always feel empowered and feel progress. Like every day I'm motivated to be better than the last. I just have this drive that I'm sure a lot of people have drive to keep pushing them, but like, I just could not stop. You, you taught me one move. I wanted to learn three more with stunts, you know, because every day you're getting better no matter what. And that is so satisfying. It's so much exactly what I needed. I finally was like happy, you know, just in on this path, on this journey where people are empowering me, believing in me. That was that was just something that I didn't really know I needed. And I didn't know I was so good at being so focused and dedicated to one thing and to stick on the path for stunts was, it was just exciting. And there's something new every time. And then like, I know I'm straying from this question, but like, I used to be someone who would never walk on the street, you know, like even in the suburbs, you know, I, like in the middle of the street in a little neighborhood, I would never walk in the middle. I'd be like, everyone needs to be on the sidewalk, safety first, follow the rules, bad things can happen. Don't go upside down on the monkey bars, you know? And I just feel like stunts took all that away from me. It was like, let's be excited to confront things that are scary. And I had no idea I was that person. I have and so I many questions <laughs> about, about sort of where you are now, but I, I want to, I want to, for the sake of chronology, I want to ask you more about, I guess, the sort of the personality aspect. So you, you've kind of already answered this in to some degree. So are you by any chance familiar with the the Big Five? No. So the Big Five is a personality assessment. Uh, it it I guess its history begins with Gordon Allport, who is an amazing psychologist and um, one of the very few people to kind of call Freud out. Uh, basically to his face. Um, he wrote a phenomenal book called Prejudice. It's probably somewhere behind me. Um, so Gordon Allport basically was a uh, personality. Well, he was a psychologist for many different uh, topics, but he was kind of a pioneer in terms of personality. So he took uh, thousands of words that describe personality and kind of brought them into different uh, gradations to see what what would be uh, sort of central traits to people? What would be secondary traits to people? What would even be cardinal traits? Cardinal traits are much rarer. Um, but that was in the 1930s. And uh, the next decade, Raymond Cattell uh, took these 4,500 different uh, descriptors and condensed it into 16, again, adjectives or traits. Uh, and that became known as the uh, the 16 personality factor and then moving forward, you had a variety of different people sort of refining it and refining it down, uh, including uh, Lewis Goldberg, who was the one to f uh, basically coin the term the big five. And then you have people like Paul Costa Jr. and Robert McRae, who in the 1990s and early 2000s basically conducted longitudinal studies to see if, if this was cross-cultural, the big five. And the five traits are... Mm. So the the easiest way to remember it is ocean, O-C-E-A-N. So it's openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So these are the these are sort of the five main gigantic uh we'll call them trait clusters, if you will. So I was I was going to assume that people who enter this field would be very low in neuroticism. Neuroticism is basically your how how sharply you react to negative stimuli. And if someone is, as you said, uh, afraid of walking down the center of an avenue or even like a, a, a street in the suburb, then no. Then I think you know being risk uh, adverse averse would would not be necessarily something. So when you when you see these descriptors, openness, conscientiousness, like the, how, how strategic you are, how reflective you are, how your meticulousness, 
uh, agreeableness, um, your um, extroversion, like your 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 sociability, and uh, neuroticism. How do you think you fare, and how do you think people who enter, not stay in, but enter this field? For example, do you think that some people who enter the field just so happen to be higher on the neurotic scale, maybe just to unshackle themselves from that sort of mind state, as as you've done? It's so different. Honestly, every single person I know has gotten into it for like some different reason. And they have all had some sort of I guess the through line is some sort of drive to kind of be like a kid again. Like that is at the end of the day, like one guy, he loves racing his cars. He's a freaking pro amazing at racing his cars. But when he's doing it, it's like the smile on his face. And when he's promoting it, it's like, you might be like, are you psycho? Like you just drove a car through fire, but that was like the happiest time of his life. But him his drive to do that and to want to be a kid i think that would be the through line for for everybody that would make us all similar but a neuroticism is that the way to say it i i i guess maybe i need to be i need to be more familiar with like what a person who would have that trait be like on on a day well have you met people for example who have entered the field being kind of like you when you entered the field, which is, you know, and I don't want to be presumptive, but um, uh, being a, a little bit neurotic, being you, you were also a little bit shy, right? Yes. Yes. So that that so that's low on the extroversion. So more of an introvert. Did you find other people? And I'm talking about more like people who have entered the field. Have you found that same those qualities or is it more uh, varied in people who enter the field? Entering the field, since a lot of people are unfamiliar with the trajectory of like where it's going to take them, a lot of people will probably enter because they have some sort of background. They're, they're trying to help their career in another way too. So they'll come in thinking like, this is for me. I'm doing this for me. And I'm here to learn this for me. But then when you start to train often, you realize a lot of stunt work is groups, it's networking, it's hustling, it's group things, it's training, it's safety together, like you kind of have to force yourself to be an extrovert. Um, Because if you're too shy, you really can't move forward. Like, unless you just are the luckiest human in the world with like the most amazing skill. No, it's stunts are stunt teams. You know, it's, you are always training in groups. It's, it's the safety is such a big deal in stunts and it's a group effort. And if you're too shy to know how to communicate, uh, like I have to learn how to communicate my fears and not be afraid to say that because this is safety. Like we are not going to stop rehearsing me being thrown into a bunch of trees until like I feel good. And I need to be able to like say, I feel good. And if you're too introverted, you probably wouldn't get to that point of, of where I was in my career when I did that because it's it's a group thing. Interesting. So you, you do need to have some sort of extroversion or at least the ability to to be sociable in that you are communicating, I guess, at the very least, your worries uh, as, a, as a stunt person specifically, um, and also to be receptive to the guidance, the advice, the safety procedures, all, all the multivarious things that are happening on set. That, that's, that's interesting. So all of that is, so I guess the entry requirements are, could be very, could be var- varying. You could be very sociable and excited, or you could be someone who's shy, who's trying to combat that. You could be uh, higher on the neurotic scale, being determined to be less fearful, or you could be low on the neurotic scale. And, you know, you've kind of entered this because it's, it's been sort of part of your temperament, your sort of innate personality. That, that is very interesting. So you, you've seen that, you've seen this kind of diversity of 
uh, entrance into the field? 100%. 100%. I mean, like, there, I, a lot of my stunt friends, I'm not going to say that they're all extroverts, let me tell you, but you have to be willing to put yourself out there. Like, it is one of the biggest things for any performer, but for stunt people, they even have what's called the stunt hustle. <laughs> it's like you have to hustle, you have to be willing to like put yourself in this weird, awkward, fake seeming position, but it's like the only way people are gonna get to know you or see your abilities. If you're so talented and you're too afraid to reach out to people, then no one's going to see it or too afraid to ask for help to make your own content. You know, it's it's like a lot of people fight it. A lot of people struggle, especially when COVID hit and they really had to like dig inside and figure out like, how do I do this? I'm telling you, not not every stunt person is an extrovert. They have to force that part of them, but it's a big deal. I think most like, would not would not imagine that. I think that the the archetype and I think most people's minds of the stunt person is this kind of like reckless, careless daredevil who, you know, doesn't care and they're, you know, sort of a badass, that kind of thing. I know. You know, you do you do meet those. You meet those and I'm pretty sure on the outside people have looked at me and assumed that. I'm pretty sure of it. But um it's the the recklessness is really if you just turn it into a human who wants to play so bad and just wants to be a kid again. Like, I mean, it's what, like, how do you get someone to be excited about jumping off like a building into a thing of water that's on fire? Like only, only like the kid part inside of you is like so excited. And, and like, to be honest, I think a lot of, introverted and shy people have lived their lives this way so they never really had the chance to do something big and extreme to like empower them and make them feel this like special progress that's tailored to only you like jillian you progressed as jillian you know and and honestly i was just very lucky to come upon friends who are stunt people and to bring me out of that shell. But I'd probably say everyone has the ability in them. Like, I mean, what about you? Are, would you, if someone asked you, like, would you be willing to learn some moves? Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm afraid of heights. And once a year, I do something kind of stupid involving heights. Uh, the, the one that's the most uh, entertaining is I had dinner suspended from a crane um in armenia yeah what? yeah it was also a thunderstorm and it was the first time what? they had ever done this while it was raining and i asked them uh like have you ever done this and they're like oh we just opened last month so we're not sure how it's gonna be and i was like okay cool and obviously, you know, at that point, you just you take all the death thoughts and you're like, well, let me reflect on my life. Am I am I happy with things, how things panned out? If I if I, you know, collapse down into the, the ground and my bones just splatter in all different directions, will 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 I be content with what what has been? And I, I, I always end up saying, yeah, because, you know, my my life story is a bit a bit surreal. I love that. I think that is like I, I that that like cures or keeps the fire burning inside of you to keep doing it every year. I mean, like, look, I remember I went to summer camp when I was little and we would do the ropes course and I would like you're supposed to climb up this thing and then do like a zip line. Right. And I would climb it up. I would climb all the way up. And then I would be crying. I'd be like, please, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I'm so afraid. And they're like, the only way down is to zip line down. And I'd be like, please, no, no, no. And they're like, you can climb down. And I'd be like, no, 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 no. Like, that's how afraid I have always been afraid of heights. Like, Sam, I'm telling you, I'm telling you the amount of fear in my life about a lot of things were still there when I got into stunts. You know, I was like three years into stunts when COVID hit and I did 
the hunt and I go on to set where my stunt coach was directing the movie and he was like he was like so we need your character to um get killed by the alien and he's and your character is gonna fly into the trees so we're gonna have to rig you up to to the trees and you're gonna have to do wires how do you feel about that and I was like I don't know how do you feel about me doing that. <laughs> and he was like <laughs> He was like he was like I I believe in you and I know that you can do this and we can do a couple rehearsals and see how you feel. And I remember everyone on that set was is a friend of mine and one of my closest friends was making sure the safety was like on point, right? And I'm there rigged up to these trees for rehearsal, no cameras are rolling. And I remember the ropes course as a kid in that moment. And I was like, I was like, am I going to cry right now? Am I going to cry and beg for them to stop oh, right no. now? Like, and then they're like, they're like, no. And they go, they go, okay, Jillian. So we're going to go three, two, one, go. And on go, you have to do all the safety moves. And I was like, okay, so I'm going to do, I'm going to react on go. And they're like, yeah, on one. And I was like, there's miscommunication. I'm freaking out. And they're like, you good? And I'm like, still a little too afraid to be honest, you know, like, I don't want to ruin anything. So I was like, oh, sure. Like I'm freaking out. It's rehearsal. It's not, I wasn't flying up. I was just flying back first. And, um, I stood there, they're going three, two, one. And in my heart, I'm like, I'm going to just immediately start crying. Aren't I? And then they pull me back. And I think my life changed because like the fear was gone. Like I, my fear for heights not gone, but my fear of like that memory and being stuck like in a, in a really difficult situation, that fear is gone. Like I was like, again, let's do this again. Let's do this. Now we were, can like roll film. We got this. Like, so it takes, it takes time. It takes time, but like for me, I've just been really enjoying like putting myself in the moments of like where I used to be the most afraid, and I'm just like, this is why I can't not love stunts. So it's interesting. I mean, so we we've... I think I went off on a tangent. No, no, it's beautiful. <laughs> it, it is interesting because what we were talking about originally was like what are the traits when people sort of enter this field? And you've mentioned going and doing a scene repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly and kind of resolving that fear from the ropes class. I'm I'm interested in what keeps people in the field because this is a whole new sort of uh, list of personality traits. Hans Einzig, who is a very uh, famous English psychologist and his wife, Sybil Einzig, and Marvin Zuckerman did a study in 1978. Uh, it was about 1,300 American and Englishmen who uh, were they were basically testing their sensation-seeking qualities, and they they what what they they ascertained a lot of things, including the fact that as you get older, your like thrill-seeking decreases decreases. Men are a little bit more uh, sensation-seeking, uh, are high sensation-seeking than women. Americans are a little bit higher than uh, the English, um, so they they would they also revised the scale. They they're the the people who made the SSS the sensation seeking scale, and they would ask them questions like, "I would like to try parachute jumping," or "I think I would enjoy the sensation of skiing fast down a high mountain slope." And it was just a fascinating study where they, they were just trying to figure out what what exactly, what are the traits of people who are high sensation uh, seeking and sort of what what are they like? And it obviously this relates to, to stunt work in that doing a stunt once or twice is one thing, but when you stay in the field for years, that that's different. It's no longer this kind of... Um, what is it called? The the sort of the, the romance period is kind of faded. The honeymoon phase is kind of faded. And now there's these these personality traits that need to keep you there. So in from your interactions with people who have been in the field for a long time and for yourself, what traits do you think keep people in stunt work? 
this is like such a it's such a easy and difficult question um i would say the general like what keeps us all here is that we've spent years of training that leads to the gig that makes us you know so that's kind of the general what keeps you in like what kept me in i just started as an actress wanting to learn some moves i kept going as someone who loved this empowered strong feeling about myself i kept training because i loved overcoming fears but like that was three years you know like that's and i had only booked my first gig the the first year and that was very you know it wasn't a, a union gig um so what keeps you going is to elevate your skill set you might be a great fire burner you might be a great martial artist uh or a great racer but i mean every day you're getting better so you stay in it because you know you're just going to keep getting better your network's going to be stronger and eventually your connections like you won't have to be hustling so much and so as the years progress, the hustle can eventually be less and you start to book things based on word of mouth or a simple email um, or just showing up and reminding people who you are. So my main response to that would be like, people stay in it because they're dedicating decades of their lives to um, perfecting their craft which you know they're they're life skills that are never be perfected so you'll just be doing it forever and then you kind of eventually like you know your body can only take so many hits and falls there's a whole other trajectory after that so that's what keeps people in the stunt hustle in a general way so it, it sounds like things uh, qualities like being very aspirational like having this capacity to almost this indefatigable drive to become better and better and better at something that you know doesn't necessarily have an end goal. Whereas some people might be moving towards something that has a very, very static, determined milestone that they're trying to reach. Whereas it sounds like in, in this field, it's just trying to get better and better and better at something that's infinitely improvable. Yeah, there's no end result. I mean, I can say my end result would be to have my own movie, superhero movie. But after that movie is done, I'm going to want to, I'm going to have learned a, another skill and I'm going to want to be better at that skill. And I'm going to keep on going, you know, like, it's just like you, you just can't stop too. Cause it's also, there's so many new things things in life that you don't even realize you don't so know. So it sounds pretty clear that curiosity and a sense of adventure are also pretty dominant aspects in the personality of people who stay in this field. Who, And by the way, when I say a sense of adventure, I don't mean that they're necessarily looking for an adventure. I do mean that as well, but rather that they find the adventure. So some people, they, they, they'll go to a library and they'll just look for that one genre that, that really speaks to them. Others might kind of peruse around. They might be more interested in things that are tangential to their sort of their epicentral interests and might be very inclined when they see something that's very curious. Some people might be very inclined to learn more and some people might not be. So that that open mindedness, that sense of adventure, the, the curiosity to even ask the question, to even enter the damn library uh, seem to be very important qualities for maintaining uh for for staying in that kind of career i guess also like pain tolerance would have to be one as well and and the wanting to collaborate with people collaboration is key it is what helps you thrive and move forward that is that is the that is a period at the end of that sentence how many how many people do you interact with in in that kind of field if i can ask so you're on set is it just one or two people as like a stunt coordinator and an actor? Or how many people do you interact with in, let's say, a, a given scene? So typically, if you're 
going in if i'm gonna be a stunt double how about that i'm just gonna double i'm not like a soldier or anything in the scene i'm just going to double the actor right so in that sense there's going to be the coordinator and and or the choreographer um like they have a fight coordinator a stunt coordinator it like really depends on the gig and on the budget um there is what's called a previs, uh, which is a pre-visual of what the stunt is going to look like. And that's what you do a day or a few days beforehand. And that will have, hopefully the actor will be there. Uh, all the stunt people will be there. Um, and it just kind of sets up the scene. So for day of the set, they kind of just like wait till the end, which is not the funnest part for stunt people, but you know, um, they wait till all the acting is shot out. And, um, and basically it's just you, uh, the other person you're fighting or tackling or doing whatever you're doing within the scene. There's the, the camera guy, which is the director of photographer. You'll have the director there, maybe depending on the situation, a producer or two might be there. Uh, to just kind of assess like how it's all looking. Um, honestly, it always varies on the budget, what the scene is, um, yeah, and what's going on. So, but that's pretty much, yeah, I hope that, that ever <laughs> Is that ever intimidating to be around maybe let's say 12, 12 people who are essentially talking to you about something that you're doing? Is that ever like an intimidating uh, aspect? Not for me. Um, I think most stunt people are, you know, we're hired because we can do the job and everyone believes in us on set. We, there is a good amount of respect that I've luckily experienced on set. I know it's not across the board, but um, people do see us stunt people as like, oh, you're such a badass. Oh my God, you're going to tackle this football player. Or are you going to whatever? So they want to make sure you're okay. Nothing's going to be more intimidating than the thing you're going to do most likely. It sounds like, but I, I know some people can be very, very introverted where a bunch of people staring at you, waiting for your sort of reaction to what they're saying might be, um, intimidating but again it seems like people who have been in the field long enough that that kind of aspect fades away into the professionalism that you move into because you're no longer being judged necessarily on because a lot of anxiety comes from honestly from evolutionary psychology from the idea of being like kicked out of the band the band meaning like the the group that the tribe is a better word that you would travel with um and if you're already in if you're already in that sort of community, I guess would be the word, you're you're already in there. So the idea that you would be intimidated by people who are essentially on your team, working with you, relying on you, um, excited to see you perform, knowing that what you're doing is intrinsically a bit dangerous. Uh, I think that 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 kind of checks out that the the social anxiety of it kind of gets backseated very quickly even if you have social anxiety like naturally yes although there are the times where you know you're on set and you just don't like it, what's frustrating is you know you're called to set at like 5 a.m but you're not fighting until like 6 p.m how how long have you been there that you've stretched, now you've overstretched, you've gotten cold, like it's, you you don't want to overlearn the fight. It's like a whole ordeal. And then, and then you only get 30 minutes to do something where in your previs, it was about an hour because that's just how it is sometimes. And, you know, you want to be helpful for everyone on set. You know, you only have a half hour, you know, everyone wants to leave. They're so tired. And so you can be like, you can be like, wait, this, you know, I'm about to do a fire burn and my shit's not properly. I know what to do in worst case scenario, so I'm fine, but I know I'm not going to look the best. I, like mo most majority stunt people will always put safety first, but um, there will be the times where they put safety first and they know they won't look the best. 
and then not looking great in your fight or your burn or anything like that, people who are watching might not call you back or people who watch the movie and know your t- your stunt team, they might not call you back. So it's like, there is that underlying worry that, that you, you didn't do it the way that they had imagined you were too tall, you, you're, you were too messy or whatever. So, so there is that underlying worry, but I don't think it's an, it brings too much anxiety because everyone on set is a professional. Like you are there cause you're, you're good at it. That's so fascinating. So this, so you said you, you can get on set at like 5 AM and your scene could be as late as 6 PM, right? Yeah. Like there's scenarios yeah. where that can happen. Okay. So then, yeah. I guess the question would be knowing that you're going to, you know, jump off a building or I don't know, do something that involves uh, an excruciating, a potent, if done wrongly, an excruciating amount of pain. What, what, what do you tell yourself? What goes through your mind? What is the self talk? What is the sort of the, the coping mechanism you utilize to avoid being sort of inundated with stress and anxiety because anticipating, anticipating, uh, pain actually increases pain because you're, you, you're the, the brain regions that are responsible for called brain pain processing. Those become very active when you're expecting to get hurt. Now, of course, I don't know if you, I don't know if you can, expect to get hurt for 13 hours. I don't know if that, I think, you know, a fuse will blow. Uh, but, um, it's, 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 it is, it is fascinating though, because I mean, everything in terms of all sensations, by the way, are, are illusory. They're, they're illusions. There's a series of events that occur. And if you remove one of them, the reception of whatever the sense is, including pain is completely altered. Um, but but going back to the question, I know we could discuss sensations if you'd like. But what what self talk? What what do you what do you do to get rid of that anxiety or stress? Well, for example, if you're waiting all those hours and you're just like, what do I do? I'm, I'm my stress is building in that sense. Um, music for me is a big one, or you know just focusing on your fitness, like not focusing on the fight, you know, the fight, you know what you're there for, you're gonna be great at it. You can't overdo it in your brain, or it's literally like a dance, you know, and so um, my main focus is music. I, I like I don't music will keep my energy up. And I won't like sink in too much. And like, you know, if you if you've been, if you've been stretching and like running around the block, like for four hours, it's exhausting. So, um, I don't know. I, it's, it's more just like, you know, network, you, you fill your time with networking or also I pay a lot of attention to behind the camera stuff. I'm just like, I'm just, I fill my time with things that I can learn and not with things that will stress me out. So I will, I'll go and watch them take things apart and ask questions if they let. I mean, the, the exercise aspect sounds perfect. I mean, you, you'll get essentially what, once you learn about, once you start thinking about the fear, naturally you'll start to get a fear response. So you'll, you'll basically enter in, in a small sense, at least you'll, you'll begin to enter sort of that fight or flight and fight or flight is one of the most taxing things on our body. I mean, you think about what fight or flight actually is. I mean, your, your, your pupils change because you, you're better able to see in the dark. You're better able at detecting movements. You start sweating to cool your skin, your blood changes, uh, the, the circulation changes so that it can coagulate faster in case you're slashed somewhere, uh, that you, you can really bleed out quickly. You're faster, you're hyper oxygenated, you're stronger. But that all comes at taxing things that are more secondary and often autonomic, like reproduction and um, and uh, just anything involving like executive function and relaxation. So uh, digestion, for example, goes down if you stay like that too long. So you you do need to do something to get yourself out of the mind state of being directly in 
that whatever the the physical confrontation will will eventually be ele- uh, 13 hours later <laughs> yeah yeah 100 percent. what kind of exercise would you do or like you say focusing on your fitness what what would be something that for example you would do well for me i specialize in martial arts so i would folk uh like there are warm ups that keep you limber, you know, like it's not just stretching, like dynamic exercises, uh, run, run around in all different directions with your body. Um, I like to do things that'll, that are fun. I'm not, I'm not, there, I'm not there lifting weights, uh, to be, you know, you're not lifting to go and fight someone, you know, you gotta keep your heart rate up, run around, sing a song. You're not just going to bang out Romanian deadlifts. I mean, like I want to, <laughs> but it's fun. It's great. Like sometimes if there are multiple stunt people on set, you do fun little uh, like things together because you know, like this will keep you occupied. It'll be fun, not boring. And time will pass a lot quicker kind of thing. Yeah. It also gives you a reason to have your heart rate up. I mean, people think that when you, when you see something, you're, you, you then have the sensation and then that's that's essentially your reaction to it becomes the experience but if you have that adrenaline rush and you're you're very and then you start you know jumping rope or doing push-ups or start doing kicks the adrenaline rush is actually being used yeah. and you are now signaling to your body thanks for the adrenaline rush we, we, we used it we're good the 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 theoretical bear that's charging towards me has now been vanquished. I love that. I love very that. Very smart. It's a very smart coping mechanism. I'm so smart. <laughs> but Yes, you, know, you are. You know, it's really interesting. I, I know that you said we'll get to the question and, and I'm here to hear it. I, I'm, I'm so interested, though, on what comes first to your mind about stunts and what stunt people worry about it, pain or fear? I guess the first thing I would think of is courage uh, because, and, and courage in that courage, not, not being bold, but being genuinely afraid and sort of acclimating to the process of looking fear in the eyes as you approach it and being, being okay with sensing fear, feeling fear, and moving through it, I, 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 I never really thought they were necessarily uh, crazy or whatever term uh, people might use for this kind of field. But I always thought that they would have to be acclimated to dancing with fear. Mm. That's something that I, 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 I genuinely believed going in this, and uh, I still believe now. That being said, a part of me did wonder at some of some of the stunts that people do and just how they could pull them off. So I guess um, to some degree, adventurousness is definitely something that comes to mind. Being fit, I think, is almost an inevitability if you're going to be doing things that require pushing the body. Mm-hmm. So those are, I think, the, the three things that come to mind most readily. Courage definitely being chief amongst them. Yeah. I love that because, you know, I, I, I think about how people look at stunt people, you know, and, and you're just like, oh, you're ready to take like a hundred hits today. And in reality, it's like, we're training so much and we're doing the previs to prepare all the choreography. So no one is really going to punch me in the face or kick me in the guts, you know, like, um, the wires are, is such a team effort that all of the flailing moves, you know, like it's, it's choreography, fire, a guy is set on fire and it's dangerous. Yes. But it's choreography and teamwork. And so like the, any time I'd, I honestly, thought of anything that I was worried about. It was mostly because of the fear of approaching it. I never even, maybe because I'm silly and maybe because I just way trust my team, but like, I never worried about pain, 
you know, like um, my idea of pain when I got into stunts was progress. You know, it's like you worked out for three hours. You you were in the dojo for two hours. Like I was sparring guys and I would just be like, um, I can't move my entire body. But it's that's a pain where I'm like, but that that means I got better today. Like I I never really had a fear that I was going to feel any enormous amount of pain even when I was on set and they were like we're gonna throw you into trees you know I um what my first gig I had to tackle a football player and we were doing it like on cement because that's just what happens sometimes to us and um I was more worried about like I was more fearful for safety than to fearful for if I'm going to feel any pain from this, you know? Yeah, of course. I mean, pa- pain is a very, it's a, such an interesting topic and, and how people sort of wrestle with pain. Yeah. Pun, pun definitely not intended there. <laughs> I mean, I have a very high pain tolerance. I mean, I, before even getting into stunts, I, I knew that, um, I'm very lucky, thank God, um, for that. But uh, yeah, I guess for me, it was mostly about confronting fears. Like pain is like, pain is progress. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So that's that's how you sort of conceptualize pain now. Yeah, I'm sure before stunts is not, I mean, before stunts, I, I was afraid to walk in the middle of the street. So, I mean, I would be, I right. mean, I literally cut my finger once and blacked out from the blood pre stunt life. Whoa. Yeah. That's so unexpected. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling that's, you. That's that's high in the neurotic scale. That's I I know I know you've already said this, but it, you know, you're you're bringing it back up how how I love being wrong. I really love <laughs> being wrong in, in assumptions, you know? Cuz I would think I would think that the neurotic the neuroticism would be very low that you would be not that you, again it's not about necessarily being bold but rather that you would you'd have a lower so you'd have a very high threshold for you know what can actually bother you 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 you'd be very strong against like negative stimuli uh but no not necessarily that's so fascinating i'm oh. telling you i'm telling you <laughs> you know this reminds me i I, I did a one of my earlier episodes. Uh, it was with Jack Jamgochan. He's um, someone who he's an entrepreneur who started his own hot sauce company. Mm. Um, he's awesome. His company is called Rugged Jacks, mm. and we were talking about it. And one of the things that uh, it is genuinely shocking to a lot of the viewers was that hot sauce, the the spiciness that you feel, is not registered in your brain as a taste. It's not registered at all as a taste. It's registered as pain. That's all it is. It's a certain type of pain that we just so happen to enjoy. And, you know, it's, it's, it really is a fascinating, fascinating idea that we can come to enjoy pain. And there's, there's a lot of different theories on it. Um, and I, I, it's pretty evident that stunt, stunt people would also have some of that experience. Maybe maybe not the entirety of the same experience as one who enjoys hot sauce, but the, the, the theory behind it is pretty, pretty damn fascinating to be honest. I mean, I really like that because I feel like for stunts, it's, it's just very much about overcoming things and moving forward. And sometimes you got to feel a little bit of pain to move forward and then it's I just to be honest I just don't know if I ever thought I would ever be this person to say that I but like I I like I said it's like it's like when you live a lot of your life being like I'm too afraid to do any of that you never really had the chance I never really had the chance to know like will I ever look at pain differently you know, I really never thought I would. I, I mean, I, I, I can't even tell you. Like, I just didn't. 
I wasn't good with blood. I wasn't whatever. And once you start breaking the walls of fear, it's like everything is out the door. Every idea you used to have is out the door. And it's a trip. It's an absolute trip. And I know that a lot of a lot of people I know, like there's this woman I know, she's such a badass and she's badass in jujitsu. But after she she got injured, she had more fear about being injured again rather than fear of feeling pain from her injury. Like it's just uh it's interesting. Yeah, I mean that her schema has changed. Her 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 perception of that particular act has changed mm-hmm. because of the consequence. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh so I mean I the the idea again of pain is is also fascinating because even single-celled organisms that don't really have you know obviously a central nervous system experience pain and our sense of pain is so freaking complex you mentioned that you have a now high pain tolerance which i assume is also something that develops with years in this particular industry from brain studies that we've seen so far uh when people have high pain tolerances they have more uh robust gray matter volume in certain brain regions brain regions like the insula, uh, the anterior cingulate cortex, mm. and the prefrontal cortex. And these, when, when you think about what these three things do, it, it actually is very interesting. And, and this is, the, you know, the, the origin of psychology is essentially religion and philosophy. Th- these are the origins of psychology. And even when you get very nitty gritty into fMRIs, like very, very nuanced brain scans to see like what substructures are activated and what aren't it's it it tells you so much the the prefrontal cortex for example is responsible for executive function it's responsible for reflection for social behavior the um the insula is responsible for uh what's called interoception it's essentially your you know like there's not just five senses it's not just seeing smelling touching hearing uh, tasting. It's, it's also your sense of balance, your sense of time or chronoception, your sense of pain, nociception. Um, this, this idea of interoception reflecting on your internal state, being able to consciously reflect on it. And if, if you are continuously combating the sense of pain that that would obviously have to really operate and of course the anterior cingulate cortex is pretty much one of the places where pain is processed Mm -hmm. so if you're in pain repeatedly that area would have to become stronger and stronger especially if you have to consciously override the desire to flee from whatever is causing you pain because pain is obviously a signal that something's wrong that you have to change something in in whatever environment you're in I am blown away by that. <laughs> Interestingly, by the way, one of the areas um, for willpower, this has been uh, determined kind of recently, uh, one of the areas for uh, willpower is also, it's a part of the anterior uh, cingulate cortex, the anterior mid-cingulate cortex. And they find that people who uh, engage in um, inhibition, in inhibiting themselves, from things that they desire and this sort of like hyper disciplined behavior that area is more robust in these in these individuals so it's almost like if you can look at willpower in a very specific neuroanatomic way it's in that same area that's re- responsible for a lot of pain reception wow. so again very philosophical sort of almost automatically i think i understand myself a little bit more because of that um because um because I'm saying all these great things about, you know, it, it, it's always been just fear and the pain is progress. But like, you know, like it takes, I had a, I had a bad accident and I was, I think I was on that path, what you're talking about of like, pain is progress. I'm moving forward, moving forward, moving forward and, and strengthening myself and like literally not stopping, not stopping since the day I started. 
and always progressing and always getting better. Um, and then when I had my accident, uh, I felt pain in a whole other way. And it wasn't just physical pain. It was the pain of not being able to train anymore. The pain of not feeling that release, like those endorphins, that progress that I owe so much desired, like on a daily basis, not being able to feel progress on a daily basis, not being able to exercise or learn a new skill or work on a skill, all of that just created this whole other realm of pain that I had never experienced before. And it made it so to the point where I feel like the pain persists physically and emotionally because of the years where I kind of just put it to the side. Like I want to be proud and say pain is progress. And like, it is what drove me to keep going. But I mean, who who knows if I might might have paid a bit more attention to to like pain as an emotional thing because as a stunt person when you take away all of the stuff that that they're doing to to train and prepare for the call you know to be on set it when you take that away it's a pain that trumps any other pain in the whole world. Uh, It's interesting that you say that because social pain and physical pain are registered in the same neural pathways in a lot of the same neural pathways. And I I don't think most people would, would assume that. And I mean, social isolation, for example, has, has been shown to have enormous detrimental effects. It's one of the reasons why People who have had solitary confinement, their risk of suicidality is so much higher. And, you know, one could ask, well, maybe it's because of the factors that led them to eventually be in solitary confinement. But even when you do those comparisons, it's still startlingly high. Um, it's, it's clear that we need some sort of some sort of social connection, even if we are intensely introverted. So it and you also see it with athletes, athletes who have an injury that and, it, this is obviously in sports that are social. If they if they can no longer be in that collaborative network, let's say a football player, because football players their career span is about two years, um, they they tend to immediately get depressed when they're no longer in that in that um, that that social environment. So it is fascinating how how much that togetherness not just entertains us, but gives us this sensation of th- this is this is good. Even if there's pain involved, like football, for example, like stunt work, this is something that uh, is, is rewarding, enough for me to come in the next yeah. day. Wow, well, I feel very validated right now. <laughs> Speaking of validation and entertainment and all these things, what do you think drives people, I uh, kind of want to zoom out, what kind of draws people to watch these kind of things, to watch, not, I mean, a football game, sure, uh, I guess with football games, people feel this kind of illusory connection to the hometown, even though maybe like 20% of the people are actually, of the players yeah. are actually from your hometown or whatever yeah. town you're in, yeah. uh, or city, but with like with like action movies, for example, what do you th- what do you think draws people to action films? Because this is something that you do as well. Even even just not just as, but even without stunt work, working in an action film, what do you think draws us people to view these kind of films? I thought about my dad when you were talking because my dad is the one who kind of got me into really enjoying action films when I was younger. And it was really just like Indiana Jones, big, big on Indiana Jones and Mission Impossible. But what I think would always bring my dad or people I know to to films like that is the adventure. There's always some sort of wild adventure 
that's that's ensuing in an action film and a lot of people need to turn their brains off and go on an adventure a lot of the, these thrill seekers who well they wish they were thrill seekers can really like seek the thrill in front of them in a movie theater in their home on a tv it's it, we we stunt people work so hard to make you feel there and uh so I, I feel like it's a lot of thrill seekers who want that opportunity to really just be immersed in those worlds. I love that. I love that. Simple. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? I mean, I guess, I guess a, a few things. I mean, there's, there's the transportation theory, which is kind of what you're referring to, uh, which is basically like, the idea of being so immersed in something that you're you feel like you're there you i mean you can get this with books you can get it with uh, pretty much anything that's not you i guess not directly you uh not your exact experience i also think of uh i guess uh, i guess a variety of things but parasocial interaction where you you kind of you you are interacting with something beyond beyond the duration in which you're experiencing it. So for example, um, the an episode of Game of Thrones ends where you learn the origin of Hodor's name uh, being Hold the Door. And my roommate and I at the time, uh, we looked at each other and we were just like, holy... And we just kept like saying this to us. And as the credits are rolling, we just go like, holy crap, holy crap, holy crap, back and forth, back, just ping ponging this and just thinking about the decisions that he made in the direction, thinking about the actual sacrifice of this, the most innocent character and most benevolent human in the entire show. Um, and I remember it just, the credits were rolling and rolling and then we watched the director's like discussion afterwards and they said... Um, when George R. R. Martin told us the origin of Hodor's name, we looked at each other and we said, holy crap. And I was like, oh my God, that was us just now. <laughs> like, uh, so part, part, part of it is that, the parasocial interaction, the continuous experience that you have of the particular thing. And I mean, we, we see that in children a lot. Um, what's, what um, developmental psychologists like Lev mm -hmm. Vygotsky and Jean Piaget call pretend play so i remember as a kid i would watch dragon ball z and that kind of informed my own sort of like ideas of growth and all growth comes from struggle this is something i've been telling myself since i was at least 10 years old and i remember my dad being so proud at me coming to this conclusion it was from dragon ball z the idea that every time they got hurt and once they healed they would actually be measurably stronger and faster um and I would think about that all the time where I would run. And if I was really winded afterwards, I would be like, oh, that's that's strength. That's strength that's happening. Um, and I, I mean, I still kind of have this philosophy today wow. because I, I just think of babies and they have to fight against gravity in order to develop the musculature to stand upright. Um, and when you learn that there is a, a structural rearrangement, that's a bit of a neuronal strug uh, struggle. And that's what learning is. And it, I guess this is just, this is getting more, I guess, neuroscientific and philosoph uh, philosophical again. But uh, that that idea, all of these different things, and, and also vicarious learning, the idea that you learn from watching. This is something that, um, mm -hmm. if I could take a step back, actually, for the longest period of time, psychology was dominated by these people called behaviorists. These are individuals who believe that humans are essentially this kind of complex equation of the the stimuli that hit us so we we're there's nothing really working with the information or or it didn't even matter because it wasn't measurable at the time this is across uh, up until like the 50s and 60s um that learning was reward or learning was the removal of a punishment or the removal of something that we we didn't like uh, something that um, was it could be painful or any sort of noxious stimuli. <clears throat> uh, 
one of the many thrusts that kind of really broke their dominance over psychology was uh, the psychologist uh, Albert Bandura, who showed that we can learn from just observation, vicarious learning. And one of his experiments is called the Bobo doll experiment, where um, children were watching adults interact with a basically like this clown bobble stuffed thing. Um, and if the adults were punching it, or if they were really kind to it, the the toddlers, the, the young children, would interact in a very similar way. There's no reward, there's no punishment, yet learning manifests. And that that I think that specific facet, I gave you the history of it, that facet that we can learn vicariously is I think something that interests us. I mean, how many times when Sherlock Holmes figures it all out, are we like, whoa, and we get excited. And then even the slightest <laughs> suspicion or mystery happens. Like we can't find the remote in our own in our own apartment or our own house. And we're suddenly like, well, in my common occurrence, I <laughs> and you start Sherlock Holmesing <laughs> for absolutely no reason other than you had experienced this and you're kind of you pretend it. playing. And this is not exclusive to children. Uh, my dad does this too. After watching a James Bond film, mm. I, I'll, I'll see it in the way he he drives uh, and. It's, He's different, different, definitely. Uh, and you know, it, it, it's a, it's a, in, mm. evolutionarily, it mm. makes sense because it, we're kind of testing different behaviors that we can kind of get away with, which obviously complexity of behavior can lead to imagination, lead to growth, lead to innovation, uh, lead to some new rewards across the horizon of our typical behaviors. That totally reminds me, like, you remember the movie Atomic Blonde with Charlize Theron? I don't know if you. It was yes. I don't. I don't think I saw it. It came out around the same time I joined, uh, got into stunts, and I remember learning some moves. And then I go and see this movie, and I was just like empowered as all absolute hell, dude. Like I was like. Hold on. Everyone, like the stare scene um, that Charlize does with her stunt double, like this whole thing was just a beautiful, like all the stunt people who were training me would be talking about it. Everyone was, and I was like, first off, I really want to be talked about so highly. <laughs> uh, so it was a bit uh, narcissistic, I guess. I don't know. A selfish. Um, but just seeing Charlize on the screen. Inspiration doesn't have to be narcissistic. Thank you. Oh my God. Can you put that on a poster? <laughs> Make it a sticker, a t-shirt. Um, I saw Charlize, I saw her and her stunt double do this beautiful fight. And I really believed in myself all of a sudden. Like I had been learning a few moves, but all of a sudden I was like, I think I can do this, you know? Uh, so it was kind of like, I didn't learn from her, but I learned like as an, I can be an independent woman strong badass woman the lead in a movie lead in an action film movie like woman i can do that because charlise did it and i can i can do it like that's how i learned that's what that's my takeaway vicarious learning yeah 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 it's it's it is an awesome idea i mean i think also there's there's also this i guess this aspect of sometimes people will watch suspenseful movies uh, which obviously oftentimes suspenseful movies and action movies can, they're not mutually exclusive. Mm. Uh, and there's interesting theories about that, which also coincidentally relate back to that hot sauce, why we have things that basically register as pain, why we engage in these kind of things. Um, and it's this idea called uh, benign masochism or hedonic reversal. It has two different names. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not as It's not as bad as it, it, as it sounds, it was <laughs> is basically. It, I believe it was coined by Paul Rosen, um, who is a UPenn professor of psychology and one of like the leading experts on disgust, and also on cultural foods. He's a very, very highly cited professor and and uh, uh, psychology researcher. 
And there's a bunch of different theories as to why we why we would watch a movie that like shocks us or scares us or drives our adrenaline up a wall as, you know, Tom Cruise is hanging off of an airplane as it's flying up in the sky. Um, and, you know, obviously we see ourselves in these moments, in, in little moments, obviously. that's We have investments in these characters. We create these these tangents of relatability with these characters. But more interestingly, especially with like scary films, shocking films, uh, even anticipating pain, like what, what you would do for 13 hours from 5 a.m. to 6 p.m., uh, a lot of that is based in that in that benign masochism, and it's the idea of sort of, sort of this like contrast of you have this anticipation of pain, and then the realization that it or this anticipation of something negative, like pain, like something that's jumping out to scare you, but then the realization that you don't have that actual negative experience, and that contrast is benevolent you go from negative eight to zero what that is is a plus eight uh and that releases that releases a a feeling of 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 goodness essentially the the removal of a negative stimulus also in preparation for pain you have uh the release of endorphins endorphins are endogenous meaning they're created within the body morphine basically not not actually (laughs) morphine but painkillers op opiates things that'll make that'll reduce pain mm. you you also have this idea of you reflect afterwards that i'm trying to remember your exact words where you you look at that experience that you were nervous about and you're like the the ropes and you you look at it differently that's also a pleasurable sensation that that's called cognitive reappraisal, where you take that m- moment or idea or concept or or phobia, and you look at it with a new light, one that is very demonstrably more positive than how you once saw it. Now that part of you, that new perspective that's a little brighter, a little happier, a little more optimistic, that cognitive reappraisal is also pleasurable, is also a part of that benign masochism, that hedonic... Uh, reversal. I love that. That makes sense. That is, that is exactly how everything works. You, you see something that, that looks really scary to most other people. And you just like, you know, like jumping off a building. Like, I know jumping off a building seems like really scary, especially for someone who's afraid of heights. But the safety training on that stuff can really throw that fear right out the door. Like it's really, it really just throw. It's like it just goes right away because the safety of it all. It's like, like in reality, in reality, if you're going, if you're, if you're jumping off a building, right here, there's a thing you're landing on that like blows up to here, and so the safety, the fear is not even so much the height. It's just the fear is that you're tucking your chin properly and you're flailing your arms in a proper way and. And like you land properly on your back, but um, but yeah, I'm just like thinking to myself, yeah. Whenever we confirm safety is all good, it's like all of a sudden this like fear I used to have of this and this and this is just gone. Yeah, what an interesting. And nothing confirms it more than the actual experience, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Right when when you've done it once, and then you you go and do it again, and you're like, I'm I'm good. And maybe you might get bruises along the way on on lighter things, um, but it, it it you get that reappraisal each time. Yes. The first time I ever was taught in a classroom. I mean, I'm I'm pretty extroverted. I don't really have social anxiety. I, I've I've very rarely faced. The only time is when I'm being complimented because I just don't know what to do. Uh, <laughs> You're so good at that. Same with same with when people sing. <laughs> okay. The same with when people. Uh, Oh no! <laughs> it like it like <laughs> it like. Oh my god! That see like it makes my brain just disappear. Yep. I'm I'm pretty curious, like, what to you makes 
someone or qualify someone as a stunt person after everything I've said at this point or even before? Um, I guess, well, I'm more interested in what I've learned um, from you. So I guess it sounds like you, you have to have the ability to grow. You, you need to have the ability to reflect and reappraise what, what you've experienced. You need to have patience, definitely, if you're waiting 13 hours. And if you don't have a high amount of patience, you should at least be pragmatic enough to create these sort of coping mechanisms to occupy your time in a way that's genuinely benevolent, that will help you. So I think, you know, working on kicks and things like that to kind of shoot out, to, to use some of that adrenaline rush before it, it becomes something a little bit more nefarious if your body is continuously in that fight or flight state. Um, being able to work with groups of people, um, being able to trust definitely seems to be a pretty high aspect that I, didn't, I haven't really thought of uh, because you, you need to trust that the people who have orchestrated this, whether it's inflating the, I don't know what you call, but whatever you land upon, uh, or that the person who's punching you isn't actually going to, you know, shatter your super orbital ridge, uh, that, that you, you believe them when they say that this is the way it's going to happen if you do your part correctly. And with that latter part, you have to have a sense of self-confidence or, or to be more specific and also to evoke, uh, Bandura's name again, a high level of self-efficacy. Mm -hmm. Self-confidence is more of an overarching, you feel that you're, you feel good about yourself. Whereas self-efficacy is your belief that you can accomplish a particular task. And that, that I think would have to be very high. You might not necessarily be the most confident person in the world to be a stunt double or uh, to do, or to work in stunt work. Um, but I think you would have to have, have to have a high sense of self-efficacy that you feel that you you will eventually be able to do that task well, eventually. Yeah. Oh, I love I think that. arrogance arrogance would probably have to be low because arrogance is too closely affiliated with non-growth, um, sort of non-adaptability. So I think arrogance would... would supp and I haven't really thought of these things um, because... I, I think some people would think that like that cocky, arrogant, like, yeah, hit me with what you got. Those kind of individuals would be maybe the first images in people's minds when they think of uh, stunt workers. But no, it, 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 that doesn't really calculate well. Yeah, they might be they might be a little bit bold and, you know, think and have a high pain tolerance and be sociable. But I don't think they can really be too arrogant. Not 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 if they have a long career, maybe they'll have a very short career, tragically, like very, very short. Um, they'll jump into a shark's mouth or something. Yeah. It, it, jump into a shark's mouth. Uh, honestly, I mean, I'm sure you'll find some arrogant people um, who, who are seasoned and they, they don't even like they They know that everyone's happy that they're there. You'll, you'll get those, you'll get those, but it's like, everyone's a dancer it's choreography it's you know so you can't be on your own in your own world uh if you if you're supposed to be doing the whole team effort thing so i i love i love that your takeaway it's so it's so great do you think that like it's definitely now what like everything you've learned today that you're looking at films differently like action films differently maybe there's there's so many films that I, I really love that have long action sequences in them. I mean, one of my favorite movies of all time is The Matrix. And uh, I just think the, the fight scenes in that are incredible. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the ones that are not at all. Uh, CGI. I don't know if you're saying, I don't know if, I'm sure they have CGI in them, in the backgrounds and things of that sort. But I mean, the actual fight sequence is actually happening. The, like remarkable and you know from the very moment where you see um i can't remember if it was i think it was trinity or morpheus 
shooting the gun at the agent and his body kind of goes into these different directions. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, that, that's very much CGI. But just thinking about how he does those certain movements and how it looks all together at one one moment or in the, the subway scene where uh, Neo and Morphe, uh, Neo and Agent Smith are fighting each other. And, you know, the the jumping multiple kicks, Mm -hmm. the punch that doesn't reach him. So then he goes like this and hits his throat. There's so many aspects of that where it's just fascinating and and sort of just kind of reflecting on how they were orchestrating that and how the 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 stunt workers would would come in and try and ensure that the fluidity of the original actors, the even the arrogance of the movements or the the shyness or the personality in the movements are captured well. Mm. Uh, all of these things I had ne- literally never thought of. When you bring up The Matrix, though, um, I was just watching it last night because it's not going to be on the streaming platform anymore. Uh, really sad. But, um, oh, no. I don't know. Um, but, you know, when you see those moments where you think it's CGI, too, sometimes, like, you know, the in the air, the kicks, like they're on wires and so you have to learn these fights on the ground and then they hook you up to a bunch of stuff and you got to do the fight in the air but now you got to do the fight in the air with effortlessly and it's all this beautiful choreo and so this brings me to my follow-up question do you have you before we chatted have you like questioned fight technique and choreo and film? And do you think that you're going to look at it differently now? So, so the short answer is no, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought of, uh, the choreography of stunt work, uh, or of fighting scenes. Not, not really the only time. And sorry to mention it twice. I promise I watch more action films than the matrix, but the only time I actually really thought of it was when Neo was fighting, uh, Morpheus in the dojo, the digital dojo, and he was changing his martial arts fighting style with each attempt. And you would see it in the way he opened up when they began. Uh, he would do a different pose that would sort of indicate a different fighting style that had been downloaded into his mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, th- I thought that it, in a regular fight scene, like a James Bond fight scene, you, you would see almost, I don't want to say things that you would see in a regular fight, but you, you would see what, se- what seems like the most typic movements, even if they were fantastic, ones that were the most like, uh, relatable is perhaps not the right word, but you, you, would, you would see things that you would almost expect to see. Mm-hmm. Whereas, in that moment, it would it would remind you he's going through different different steps here, and each one is a test. And when I saw that, I was like, "Wow!" So he he had to actually train to do these very very different fighting styles, even if he's just learning a few sequences of each very different martial art. That is a fascinating idea to sort of sample from the dessert menu, these different martial arts. And that was probably the only time that I've actually really thought about it. I love that. Sociability, having some sort of sociability is obviously very important to stunt work because you need to be working with other people. In what what would make, like what happens in a, in a scene, in a moment, that what goes through your mind? What is the experience that necessitates that kind of, that that sort of social dynamic and how do we know that everyone knows what you know everyone knows what they're doing i i feel like ever since i got into stunts and i would tell an everyday joe uh that i'm oh i was just training at the dojo or i was doing some stunt training or wire training or circ training whatever people would always be like yeah but they don't you guys don't really fight on film and I just, I'm just here to, I'm just here to say yes and no to that, because obviously I'm not going to go ahead and punch you uh, in the face uh, on camera because that's not cost effective. <laughs> but 
in the realm of of just learning and teaching people some basic things right now um majority stunt people have learned the actual proper moves the martial arts the jiu-jitsu the every single move that you see on film they're seasoned they're trained they know exactly what they're doing but then there's the pre-visual the pre-vis before um going to set and as much as i want to like i don't know do a roundhouse kick to your face and then follow it with like you know a cross punch none all of that is going to require different camera angles and how much time is there on set to relight move around all this stuff so you have to organize your choreography to be prepared for like worst case scenario or maybe um you didn't have a chance to talk to the director of photography or the director on like you know you want a really fierce kick right here a really fierce punch right here really fierce fierce reaction right here and the only way for the audience to consume this movement is to move it in this direction. So I would maybe look like I'm I'm crossing at an angle and people are like, why would anyone hit that leg? But it makes the scene more effective. It makes the it makes the hit and every single variable in this entire story more effective if we cross punch, if we roundhouse here. Uh so it's I want everyone to know that majority mostly all stunt people have been trained in the proper form of the fights that they're doing. When you're on camera, the, you have to alter things. One, if you're working with an actor who has no fight background, you have to really figure out how to work with them there. You know, camera angles, director preferences, producer preferences, everything comes into, uh, this entire situation and then at the end of the editing so i mean i just want people to hear it from my mouth that we know what we're doing uh but we do movie magic on screen <laughs> i love that that's so cool <laughs> that's such a that's such a different thing because it's obviously you're not trying to beat someone up or defend yourself yeah. not, not really you're 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 performing that particular act yeah, I mean, like the choreo it seems is so obvious, but it's obviously monumentally different. Some people forget that that we train so hard and prepare for whatever vision that the original creator of the movie has, you know, and that'll transform into something so different than we ever expect. So self-awareness is also a huge aspect, like perhaps the biggest, actually, because you're not only doing the stunt, but also making sure the stunt looks good while doing the stunt. Yes, that is a big part of training. Like even when I'm training with my stunt coach and we just spent an hour kicking and punching and whatever the heck, um, then like there will be, we'll, we'll do the final fight at the end. Cause you know, we're learning an entire choreography and like moves of three, like beats of three. And we'll do the whole choreography in the end. And that's when my stunt coach will be like, okay, you know how we were punching like this? Okay, but when the camera is on your right at the far end over here, always make sure if the camera's there and you're doing a punch like this, you're going in this direction or this direction because you have to be prepared that not every director of photography, camera guy, cinematographer, director, not every person is gonna know what they need uh when it comes to stunts and you have to be the one to just give it to them if that if you i mean if you get um, amazing people like um well i'm not just i'm not gonna do any name drops if you get a great director who was a stunt man previous he will help and know exactly what you need and you don't have to have that in your mind at all like okay the camera's there da, 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 da. he he or she will guide you but um, that's not always the case. Yeah. <laughs> so having a stunt person, having a director that's had like stunt work experience is definitely useful. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Speaking, speaking of which, so I, I know that you're, you're doing everything. Your uh, stunt work isn't the only thing that, not, not that it's a minimal thing, obviously, 
uh, but it's not the only thing that you're doing. You're you're doing acting. You're working in production. You're working in a variety of different aspects. I guess I guess my question would be, what? How can someone contact you if if they want your services, if they want to cast you in something, or if they want to learn more about the field or anything of that sort? How, how can people contact you? What are the best ways to reach you? The best way to reach me uh, would be by email or um, Instagram. Those are my, the two forms that I will almost always respond very fast to. Your Instagram is your name. It's at Jillian Armendariz. Mm -hmm. And what was your email? Same. Jillian Armendariz at Gmail. Well, it was it was awesome talking to you. And, and thank you so much for, for teaching me all this stuff. This is this is fascinating. And obviously, it is intensely psychological, more so than I imagined, because I thought it would just be about uh, pain and pain preparation and pain tolerance. But it's obviously a lot more than that. I think that a lot of people don't really know what goes into any kind of performer's lives you know, and we all see the end result. And, uh, you know, I'm people move to New York or California, and they're like, okay, in five years, I'm going to be a successful actor in five years, I'm going to be a, a successful stunt person. And, and, and that's the goal. You know, we train to that goal. That is just not the case. And since that's not the case, you spend those years of training and learning, just like developing as a human and that kind of helps you keep moving forward helps you learn new things like when i got into stunts i didn't realize in training like they were all like taking videos in slow-mo and i'm like why are, why are you doing that and and they're like well this is the best way to learn you have to see like you know oh you hit me on the side of my head with that hook so like let's watch it and see so that doesn't happen again and then they started moving really fast on their phones, like the slow-mo. And I'm just like, whoa, I need to learn how to move slow-mo really fast so I can train properly. So all of a sudden, now I'm not just training stunts. I'm training slow-mo on my phone. But now I'm not just training slow-mo. I'm putting it into my computer to edit it as a film because I have to make my own content until I book my next gig. So now I'm learning editing. And then I'm like, well, I'm learning editing. Maybe I'll make a reel. Uh, you know, it like things start to trickle. It's a domino effect of just like skill after skill of learning and learning. And I think being just completely open to knowing that you don't know everything and you will always be learning, that'll make you the best performer. Thank you again so much for being part of the ninth episode of Universal Podcast. I am very, very grateful that we got to have this conversation because it's it's so different from uh, all the other ones that that we've had. We've never had something like this. And I just want to say again, thank you.